And then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and when... And it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled on the way, or your adversary may drag you off to the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Dawn. So a few weeks ago, um, one of my favorite sporting events of the year that happens every year came to a conclusion. Sad times, I know. I think my wife was rejoicing, but I I was sad. And this is the Tour de France. I am a big fan of watching cycling. Uh, Secret fact about myself, I don't actually know how to ride a bike. I never learnt, um, but for some reason it has grown into a love of watching other people ride a bike for a ridiculously long time, day after day after day after day for three weeks. You can see why my wife enjoys it. Um, But yes, I've been a fan of the Tour de France for 15 plus years now, watching it pretty much every year, Um, yeah, almost every day. Um, And whether you're interested in cycling or not interested in cycling, there is a name of a cyclist out there which you will probably, not definitely, but probably have heard before. Lance Armstrong. He is the, well, he is decorated in a way, the most successful race in the event history in regards to the number of tours won. He is someone who battled and overcame cancer early on in his career. And he is someone that, at the time of his career, stood up for honesty and integrity in a sport which um, was overcoming and dealing with a lot of scandals and people using performance-enhancing drugs. Also, he would have had us think, as you may or may not be aware, that despite vehemently during his whole career being adamant that he was not using performance-enhancing drugs, once he'd retired, he went on Oprah and gave an interview where he confessed to living a duplicitous life where he had been abusing these performance enhancing drugs for his whole career and using a whole lot of devious means to get around the system so he was never found out. In that one interview, 
a career, a legacy, just collapsed. It disappeared. If you look in the records, there's an asterisk by every achievement that he has possibly got because of the fact that he used these drug performance enhancing drugs. Um, it was a big scandal, this idea of this figure of integrity in a sport where at the time there was a not so much integrity. It was just crumbled, it was gone. A one-time hero of the sport suddenly became a villain. Integrity is a characteristic, or is a char in character matters a lot. This could be whether it's against something like the conscious deception of someone like Lance Armstrong, where it was deliberate, it was planned, it was intentional. It could be the idea of you not you sort of being over malleable into environments where actually you just blend in and go with the flow, where you just like, I'm going to be this person over here, or this person over here, or this person over here, and actually there's no you. You are just everyone and anyone else that you're around. This disintegrity, to make up a phrase, I think, um, or lacking integrity, can take many different forms. Um, and without a robust construct of who we are, and for us as Christians, whose we are, then actually we can all fall into this trap at times. Take, for example, something like gossiping. Now, most, if not all of us, would verbally agree gossiping is something that the Bible speaks fairly strongly against and is something that we should not do. Yet, if we were in a staff room or having a coffee break with some colleagues or just having dinner with some friends chatting, how easy is it just to slip into that trap where all of a sudden we find ourselves gossiping about someone where we shouldn't be? It is very easy. I would speculate that most, if not all, of us have done it at points. Um, but this is the sort of situation of where we've got a... Integrity is in the face of that, trying to make that conscious choice of we're in a culture, and the workplace culture is very much that, I think, in our country, of where we're trying to elevate ourselves by bringing others down. And the way that we can do that is whether it's through gossiping, belittling, a whole range of different ways that it could be. But the integrity is choosing a different path and saying, this is who I am. Regardless of what else is going on, this is who I am. And this is where we're coming to today. We've got this passage. It's quite a long passage, it must be said. Um, but a large part of it, especially the first chunk, we just see this idea of watchfulness or integrity, this idea of being ready, being the same, doing the same, not changing who we are because we're getting fed up of waiting and waiting. It is this continual, integral, this is us, and I'm going to stay true to this path. Um, but let's pray before I dive in properly. Yes, Lord, we... Thank you for the life-giving way that you provide, that you do say that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that is true, that you are the way that is life-giving. You are the one that is life-giving. Thank you that through you and the ways you instruct us and guide us, we can know how to live a life of life and love and building up rather than a life that leads to destruction. And tonight, Lord, as I speak, will you help us all be attentive to the whispers of your spirit. Will you speak through me as we explore this passage, as we, yes, draw and seek and turn our ears to you, desiring to hear from you as you speak through your word tonight. Amen. So, tonight from these passages, or this passage, I'm going to be focusing on three things we learn about Christian integrity which come from your first chunk, your verses first 35 to 48. And then two reasons why it is so important that we have integrity, which is the rest of the passage, those two things. Some of you may see where we're going with this. Some of you may have no idea, but I'm going to bring you along for the ride anyway. Um, so to begin, contextually, today's passage is an easy one where I think a lot of us read it and because we're here at this stage of history, 
we picture these verses being about the second coming of Christ, so the idea of him coming back, and that is who this master is, and that's the situation that this is all about, and that's the context that this is about. However, various different scholars out there would just sort of attest that actually for the original hearers of this, the original hearers of this passage, that would actually be really far from their thinking. That would be like the one of the last things, almost like a negative idea that that could possibly be what this is about. Actually, for them, it's this idea of seeing it as a warning to be ready for the crisis of for an upcoming crisis, for this big thing, which reading into it a little bit, you could argue would be through the events that happen around the crucifixion, which is to come. Um, and everything like that, but it's this idea of being ready for a crisis. And whilst it's not saying that the idea of reading into this, the idea of the return of Christ is wrong, it's actually saying there's probably a dual meaning going on here. The idea of being prepared for Christ's return and the eternal significance of that, but being prepared because we're gonna face different crises in life and different situations that might shake our faith and stuff, but actually by having this integrity, then we can face them in a steadfast way and we can remain steadfast in the middle of it. So just to gather the thinking now, it's for both future and now, the context is is there for this passage. So first thing we learn about Christian integrity from this passage is from, I'm going to focus on verse 38, where it says, we are to be ready in the middle of the night just as we are at daybreak. And from this, it is that Christian integrity is a lifestyle. It's not just a switch that we can turn on at certain times. It is the willful obedience and surrender to God in the dark as well as the light times of life. Even in the middle of the longest night of our lives, the darkest point that we could possibly picture or imagine, It is that idea that actually we will still be found rejoicing in the Lord. As Philippians 4.4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We are to be a rejoicing people, a joyful people. That doesn't mean we need to be your shiny, happy people all the time. It is to be the fact that actually we are rejoicing because we are clinging to the one who is bigger than it all. It is that idea when we do not know what is going on. We do not know the options that we have in front of us. We may see no way out at all, but we go, actually, all we can do is trust in the one that is above it all, created all, and knows all as the one who can see a way out. And at that time going, God, I don't understand, but I surrender to you. Your will be done in the middle of the darkest times and the lightest times. It is this faithfulness through the seasons of earthly life until the day that we're in the kingdom to come. And regardless of what life might throw at us, it is about our desires should be this idea of exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. These are the fruits of an idea of this godly life, if you will. These are the things that our desire should be going towards as we want to exhibit these things to others around us. This is the idea of the integrity. If you want to know what is the behavior that we want to have integrity in, then look to the fruits of the spirits. Look to the idea of the Beatitudes. Look to wherever we see in Scripture the idea of blessed is. This idea of good idea of actually this is something to take note about what is sort of holy living, what is the way that we should be shaping ourselves and striving for. And the fruit of the Spirit is an example. We also get in this passage that we heard the consequences of not remaining faithful. Um, And they are slightly graphic in some of their tones about some of the beatings and everything that goes on in verse 45 and 46, where it says, but suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming, and he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and an hour he's not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. It's a nice graphic warning, if you will. And it's just this 
for, for us now, we see the eternal significance of a statement like that. We see the idea of actually we, we've got the life. Got, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus' way is life, which means if Jesus' way is the only way that is life, that any other way we choose to go is death. It's the opposite of life. It is that end where it talks about the idea of being assigned a place with the unbelievers. And it is strong words. It is strong language. It is challenging to read um, because I'm sure we're all aware that there are times when we mess up and we may not seem to be sticking on that path as rigidly as we would like. We may veer off slightly to the side. But it is that cautionary thing of trying to bring ourselves back, bringing that focus back to who is it that God is wanting us to be. So first, integrity is a lifestyle of faithfulness. Secondly, integrity is active. It says in verse 43, it will be good for the servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. It is not this passivity of just waiting. It is actually requires active, conscious thought and choice. It is... There is this great, I think, a great myth, great deception out of our age, which is this, if you will, the idea of this inherent carnality of humanity, where there's this Gnostic division between the soul and the body, and we can buy into this means that where we can trick ourselves and says our body just desires and runs over and overpowers us and we do this and it's okay because that's our body. Our soul is still good. That was just the, that's just the flesh. That's just the flesh. Like we're still good people. It's just I can't help it. I can't help this behavior. I'm just wired this way. When you, when you see this language, you see crimes that go on and ways that people treat other people where it always comes out of this idea of like, I can't, it's not my fault. That's just who I am. That's just the way that we are as humans. And it is a lie. It is rubbish. Like, I think we can all speak that most of the time we see that we go, that is utter rubbish. Like, we may have been in similar situations, but we have made a conscious choice to do something differently and be different. And that is the thing of Integrity, it requires the conscious choice with whatever temptations might be thrown our way, wherever, wherever we are, whether it's with other people, whether it's on our own, or whatever crowd or situation we find. Integrity is that idea of, I'm going to consciously choose that path of life rather than that path of death. I'm going to believe that Jesus' way that he describes in Scripture and this through is actually the life to its fullness, not what we might read about, not what newspapers might say, not what your influence will tell you that life in its fullness looks like. And it's not a big house. It's not a fancy job. It's not a sports car. It's not being able to retire at the age of 30. No, life to all of its fullness is living a life that is following Jesus Christ and live, having his spirit within, within us. That is life in its fullness. It's a richness beyond all other richnesses. Um, so that is what Christian, why we talk about this Christian integrity. It's important because we want to live that full life. Um, and it's, it's, it's active, and because when we think about in Scripture, Jesus in Matthew 21 has the parable of the two sons, where there's one way, one son where the father comes, and he's like, will you come help me collect from the vineyard? And he goes, yes and doesn't come. There's the other son who says no, but changes his mind and does come. Um, and from this, it's this idea that actually integrity is not just about saying the right things in the right situations, it's about backing it up with what we do. Integrity is about our actions matching what we say. It wouldn't be very good integrity for me if, or Jonathan or Andy or Eleanor, whoever's up here, if we could once Sunday evening just came and preached a whole sermon and you just looked at us and go, actually, you're complete rubbish because I know you did this, 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 and this this week, which completely undermines everything you said. It's this idea that it matters what we do matching with what we say. Inter Jesus, if you will, actually, the living out is more important than what we say the way that we live it, we may not be able to put it eloquently, we may not be able to say everything, but if we are living it, that is what is important. It is an integrity between words and actions. And then we see that we, in today's passage, that Jesus stresses the importance of those who believe in him 
enacting God's will. It's that idea of following what the masses decreed for the servant to do and being obedient to that consistently, regardless when the master's going to return. They're there, they're ready, they're doing the jobs, they're turning out, they're not slacking off, they're not beating each other up, they're actually just continuing having this integrity. And I think... Uh, no, I think I should skip that. Um, so, sorry, it's just one of those moments where something I... Something I prepare, I have a word in my mind, and I go, no. Um, so, integrity is a lifestyle of faithfulness. And integrity is active, it's not static. And finally, Christian integrity has a posture of a servant, not a master. You read this, this whole passage, this first section, and it is the servant language. We see it elsewhere in Scripture. We see it, this idea that Jesus came to serve and we see it through the, whether it's the foot washing or other instances. It's this idea that we are, it is a posture of being a servant rather than a master. That's how we align our integrity pole, if you will, is that we are one of being a servant rather than a master. It's not about gaining power over others. It's not about that cultural thing of bringing people down so we can bring ourselves up. I actually view this idea of actually we're about, we should be trying to elevate each other. I feel like we too often get caught up in this mindset of it's a competition. Life is a competition. We have to be better than our neighbors. We have to be better than our family. Like, if you sat around a meal time with, when, you're, when you're a bit older and everyone's got a job and you're catching it, everyone's talking about it and they're talking about all these fancy jobs that they do and then there's you and you're just like, this is what I do and um, it compares nothing compared to what other people do right now and the responsibilities you have. It, it is it's like there is this idea of... <sighs> it is easy to feel small in those moments. It is easy to feel um, like our lives are insignificant. Um, but it is about celebrating the successes, successes of others as well. But life is a competition. We compare all the time is what I'm trying to say. Um, and yeah, I was at a church a few weeks, a different church a few weeks ago, uh, invited me to preach there, and I was talking to them about this culture we have, and I've mentioned it already, of I am better than you. And I think we see it in those of you that are linked with social media, social media influencers, where you've got these people that are wealthy that show off their wealth to others, and it is sort of like this idea of, look at this, let's, you want to hear all about my quarter of a million pound holiday that I went on? You want to see all this multi-million pound house that I've got? And it's almost this idea of, look at what I've got that you can't attain. Look at this. We want to watch it because we're like, this is a level above us. But it's this underpinning, like, underpinning where I'm not saying they consciously believe this but it's this idea that I am better than you. I've got something that you can't have. You're going to come and you're going to absorb this because we are better than you. And that is a philosophy I think we can run the risk of falling into and trying to stumble into this master mindset, which is what I'll call it, this idea of the, master, the, per, the servant at that time who takes on almost the responsibility of the master by decreeing what the the slaves should do, the servants should do. Um, but Jesus is clear that we should be servants. We should be getting stuck in and doing things we might not necessarily want to do. Um, it is this posture of humility because it acknowledges that we all fall short of the glory of God. It is that when you, I think, when you come face to face with your own depravity and how far short we fall of God's forgiveness and how undeserving we are of God's forgiveness, it changes the way that you see the person next to you. It's no longer a competition. It's no longer anything. You see the fact that this God who is so big and so gracious and so loving is willing to forgive us for our depravity. We are so far away from being deserving of that that actually... Everyone deserves it. It's not a competition. It's not a comparison. We are on the same team. We're trying to share the prize together. Um, in church with believers, we want to be this idea of iron sharpening iron. We want to elevate each other up. 
We want to be champions to each other. We want to celebrate the successes that everyone has. We want to stand by for when things go hard and when difficult, but that is to, in order to try and help you thrive. We want to see everyone here thriving in their lives that God has put them in and where they are. And it is a freedom that is only through Christ that we can have. And integrity says that every life matters in God's eyes because, and then as a result, in our eyes, every life has, every eternal life matters. So whoever it is, their life matters eternally. So integrity is a lifestyle of faithfulness. Integrity is active, not static. And integrity has a posture of servant to all. So why does integrity matter? And I know I've covered some of this already. Um, I got ahead of myself. I got a bit carried away at points, I know. But it matters because in Jesus' prayer to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane in John 17, he prays that you not take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, that they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Or the more often paraphrased version we may have already may have heard and be familiar with, that we are in the world, but not of it. In today's passage, the second of the other sections, we see that we are to be in the world, engaging with interpreting the signs of the time. So it's verse 54 to 59, the chunk at the end. We're interpreting the signs of the time and how and where God's spirit is working at this time. Because God's spirit is going to be working in maybe similar methods as such, but in different places than he may have done before. And it's about, God, where are you working now? Where are you working today? What are the signs of this time that are, in many ways will be unique to any other point in history? But how and where is it working? We're to understand and we're to interpret them. And it's that we're not remove it. We're not some removed people. We're not called to be removed um, and lambasting the world from our ivory towers. We're to be in the thick of it. We are to be in the world. We are to be in it. We're not outside of it. We are in. We've all got to, you have different contexts. You have different workplaces. We all have those places where we are engaging with people who don't believe in God. Um, if you don't have places where, you don't, where you're connecting with people who don't believe in God, I encourage you to try and find places where you can because that is what we're called to be. We're called to be in the thick of it. We're called to be in the world, engaging with people, being that light to them. We all have our own unique situation. We all have our own unique setting to be that light, but we are called to be in it, in the thick of the real world. And as a church, we're continuing to step into being a mission hub church, and that means we all need to be willing and discerning where is God's Spirit working in Lemington and the surrounding villages? What is God calling us to be doing as a church and us individually to reach people? And it's about going outside of these four walls. Because whilst these four walls are quite nice and there's some nice windows to look at and all sorts, we are called to go outside of them into the outside world, outside of our comfort zones, outside of what we know <coughs> and feel safe with. Excuse me. And we need to discern that. We need to discern where God is calling us. And then when we're outside of our comfort zone, when we're getting messy in the real world, we are meant to be bringing God's reconciliation to the world that we are in. Um, reconciliation can be a loaded term depending on your history, your journey, things that have happened and conflicts that may have arisen and situations that you may have been in. It is a, very much can be a loaded term and one that might seem impossible and I'm not decreeing that we have to reconcile, forgive, and be best friends with everyone that's ever been in our lives. It is very different from that from this side of eternity. But actually, our desire, our heart, should be one of reconciliation. There'll be times where that might not be appropriate. There might be times where that is not wise. There are times when that might not, they might not receive it. They may be like, <laughs> no and push us away. It's not for us to force it and come back and come back and jam it down their throat until they give in. No. Reconciliation is about that heart to desire, that heart attitude of being like, we want to reconcile 
and we want to be united, whether it's this side of eternity or the other side of eternity. But we're bringing that into a world of conflict. Um, we've heard about different conflicts, different dark things that are going on. We're in a world of different conflicts that go on, whether it's different beliefs, whether it's different cultural identities. There's a whole range of different conflicts that we come across on a daily basis. We're in a world of conflict, and we're to bring God's reconciliation into that. We're to be peacekeepers. We're to be a light. A goal and heart should be one of reconciliation whilst we're out in the world. But importantly, integrity is crucial because whilst we're called to be in the world, we're called to, not, to be not of the world. Um, Christian integrity will mean that we, can be, we are to be distinctive and different to the world. We're not meant to blend in so no one can tell the difference. We're not meant to just absorb every cultural thing that's going on and just become a clone. No, we're meant to be distinct. We're meant to be different. Scripture, as we've talked about, with stuff like the fruits of the Spirit, Scripture is clear about some of the behaviors we should exhibit and we should stand out in that way. In a world of self-preservation and self-betterment, we are called to be different. In a world of power and influence, we are called to be different. We are called to stand out. We are called to live a different life where we're not just giving into the cultural trends, where we are in the world, but we are of Christ. And consequence of this is there is a cost. As you will see in the passage from 49 to 53, where it talks about family being against family, there is a cost because not everyone will understand. And sometimes these people may be our closest loved ones. I am from a family where the majority of my family do not believe in God. And it is, they do not necessarily always understand the life choices that we make now as a family. Um, but we are, it is the idea of there's a cost, there is a challenge, because it's actually, sometimes it'd be very easy just to pacify and go along and just put my head in the sand and just be quiet and <laughs> go along with it in order not to, not, to off, not to offend, but also just not to stand out and have those awkward conversations that can come up. Um, but, and sometimes there can be heated conversations that might come up with people we love. But we are called to still be distinct and different to a place where um, there is that response, there might be that response, is it? We, um, who is it? Is it John McGinley that talks about the cockroaches and the light and the fact that um, there be, what is it, cockroaches or moths? And cockroaches run away from the light, whereas moths get attracted to the light. And the fact there's two different people, two people have two different sponsors and we can have different sponsors to God when we bring to them. There'll be people that will run away, people that are attracted to it. And we are in many ways to respect that. Um, and there needs to be a shift of priorities. If we're to not be of the world, as I say, we're not to have the same priorities of the world. We should prioritize things differently as a result of our saving faith in Christ and a desire to live that life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Christian integrity is about making the conscious choices to choose the way of those life-giving fruits regardless of what the world tempts us with, and regardless of how many times we've given into such temptations, it is that desire to pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and start running the race all over again. Integrity is not legalism. It is not a works-based salvation that we believe in. It is a lifestyle of faithfulness. It is active, it is not static. It is a posture of being a servant, not a master. And it all flows from our joyful appreciation of the ludicrous, undeserving forgiveness and salvation we have first received from God through Christ. That is why we want to be integral in the society. That's why we want to have this integrity. We want to be those lights so that others can experience that freedom and that joy themselves. Amen.